But that's just the way it's been. Now we have to hope that Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes, Sheila Hampford, can take us to the next level. We saw Hammer last night. We got to run into Jennifer Hammond. She couldn't speak more, more excitedly about what Sheila has. And she says she's not going to take any crap going forward. And I loved hearing that from her. I do too, but, but, but uh, again... This thing about the Lions' ownership, and I understand, and I, I'm just like, it's not William Clay Ford's fault. It's not, uh, uh, you know, Martha Firestone. It's Ford's not William Clay Ford's fault for fault. rehiring. Matthews. Just wait, no, Matt Millen. What I'm saying is, <laughs> it's not the owner's fault that Matthew Stafford, in the second half against, um, <laughs> it's not. No, it, it is. It's not Matthew Stafford's fault, or excuse me, it's not William Clay Ford's fault in 2014 in the second half of a playoff game. Stafford throws an INT, field goal, punt, punt, fumble, fumble. That it is, is not fault. the owner's fault. But it is his fault that he wouldn't cough up the money to get the right players on the offensive line. It is yeah. his fault that we didn't go get running backs consistently to help out the passing game. Everybody know what the Lions are going to do, and everybody on defense let them do that. Why is and, it all Always got to be the owner's fault. Bro, I mean, can't we who give pays some these accountability people? for when, the players? When the Patriots win the Super Bowl, uh, who do you see prime and center? Robert Kraft yeah. every year on Friday on, uh, on get HBO. It. Who are you looking for? Jerry Jones. Like all the owners, when they win the Super Bowl, I, I, they get the credit, and when they don't, uh, it falls on the player. But it's the owner's fault to put the money on the line to get the players in there and to make the environment conducive to win. They hired the wrong people, bro. I understand But no, you don't understand It's low-hanging fruit, But you don't understand it because you keep bringing it up. It's low-hanging fruit. If you're going to blame the owners, you blame them for hiring and keeping the wrong people here. That's the owner's fault. I understand that. I'm not blaming the owners. I never blame the owners. I blame the pieces of crap that come here. The guys that they draft that can't even make the team after sick two years. To my stomach I'm so that's scouting. That's a, that's a is, scouting it's issue. It's a whole there. thing. It's terrible. Yeah. You let guys like Kevin Colbert walk away and go to the Pittsburgh Steelers and win three Super Bowls over there. He was a, he was here. You let good people leave. If you really want to go back, you freaking had okay, like, okay. Jason Jones, Avery. How about this? Sue. You let good people leave. How long are you to give good people? For instance, they don't want to stay. How? I'm talking now. I'm gonna I'm gonna elevate this discussion Let's do that. to the coach and the general manager. We love this, okay? We love Dan Campbell. We love the kneecaps. We love Brad Holmes yeah. in the draft room. Right now. They, they take Panay Sewell. He's on the board. We see him hugging everybody. <laughs> oh, we got it. We're hugging. We're hugging. Hey, we're hugging. I don't like that oh, pick. We're hugging. I don't like it. We're hugging. I don't like that <laughs> pick. Oh, oh, we we love it. We're hugging. We're getting right. out of our chairs. Right. How long do you give these guys? Because they're probably going to win. I got. I got three, the answer too. Three games this year. Okay. Let's say they go three and fourteen this year. You know what they're going to do next year? Let's just say that the Lions go. Seven and ten next year. I think that's a reasonable. Right. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a reasonable Correct. track. Three and fourteen, you improve to seven and ten, and then in year three you make that run. Okay, here's the deal. At ten and twenty-four, yeah. after two years in the National Football League, when teams are getting good quickly. Do you get a year three? Hang on. Don't answer I was that ready yet. Too. I think you keep these guys as long as you're seeing improvement in progress. Like if you're seeing, let's say they go, uh, you know. Uh, three and 14, no. seven and 10. No, no, no. Not three and 14, seven and 10. Like let's just be, give them the benefit of the doubt of playing more games. Let's say, like, let's say eight and nine. Let's say eight in and nine. In year one? That's, that's okay. For the argument's sake. For the argument, okay, okay, let's say okay, eight, okay, nine. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's say eight, nine, Fine. and next year nine is, and nine and eight, right? Fine. As long as you're seeing improvement by positions, quarterbacks are getting better. They're making better reads from game to game. You're seeing offenses finish better on, on their blocks, the offensive line. You're seeing defense attack the physicality. You're seeing less penalties. You're seeing them in games late and close. If you're seeing improvement on a game by game ratio. Then they're they're proving their existence. They're proving that they are a good team in terms of uh, Holmes and Campbell. But if you're not seeing any improvement from game to game and from year to year, that's when you get rid of because everything that you guys are selling us, we're buying into. But you guys aren't improving. I don't see you getting better game to game. You still the guys are getting blown out. Guys still look like they're lost. They don't know what the heck they're doing on defense. If you have that, 
No more than three years. And that's really my point, Maz. How, you know, how long do you give these guys to write the ship? Because the program appears to be headed in the right direction, or at least we believe that without yeah. any mm-hmm. substance to it other than, you know, watching training camp and watching <laughs> the, the offseason. And it looks like they have a plan, and that plan is, is these guys working together. They're meshing really well together. How long do you give them? That's the question. If, if in Braylon's case... What Braylon was saying is if they're in close games, if they're playing hard, if they're competing, I get that, and I understand that. But at some point, don't you have to start winning those games, even in the first two? Can you lose seven to nine games in year two by less than four points? At what point does the narrative at that point begin to be, well, they just can't get over the hump. They're going to have to beat a green like they're going to have to beat a green bay. Like they're going to have to beat them year one, maybe not year 1, but definitely by year 2. They're going to have to steal one of those games. And they're going to have to beat, you know, Chicago twice. They're going to have to do something like that. They're going to have to go on the road and get a big win. Like they're going to have to do things like that for me to really stay on the ship. They will have to do that, but in year one, as long as I'm seeing improvement, I'm seeing progress from game to game. Like, I want Dan Campbell to, this, as we say, keep that energy. I want Dan Campbell to have the same energy that he has now, the same energy he has in all the press conferences, during preseason, uh, during OTAs. I want that energy from now through the next two years. I don't want to see things going south and not being as good. Now you're not as loud. Now you're not a knee slapper. Now you're not drinking your pike grande from Starbucks with an extra espresso shot. Now you're getting quieter. Like if I start to see, if I start to see that, oh man, I know Look what's out. up. Dan Campbell is going to be our our Bill Parcells. You that's how so? much that's how much faith I have in him. Now let me bring up Bill Parcells for a minute as a that's, Giants that's, fan. That's heavy praise, yep. man. 1979 miracle at the Meadowlands. I was there as a kid. That's the fumble. Joe Pizarczyk to Larry Zonka. Herman Edwards runs it in. Yep. They fire the whole staff finally after that. They bring in Ray Perkins, uh, terrific Hall of Famer from Alabama play with the Giants. Uh, He took him to a level. He had to leave. He went to Alabama. Bill Parcells comes in. He was the offensive coordinator. Uh, He comes in. He was the defensive coordinator. He comes in. Wears those tight spandex freaking shorts. The front (laughs) uh, Yeah, I mean, it was... He looked like a fool, okay? The blue and red You know what? He almost got fired after year two. Year two, he almost got fired because they couldn't win. They won three games their first year. I think they won five games their second year. They were going to get rid of him. George Young, the GM, says, we're going to hold on to him. I believe in this guy. You see what Bill Parcells has done. He's in the yeah, Hall of Fame. Yeah, he Belichick. Yep, he's in the Hall of Fame. Bill Belichick was there on the staff. Romeo Cornell. Yep, yep. He was, uh, that was a phenomenal staff. Yeah. What a tree that is. That's yeah. a coaching tree. Sean Payton later on in life. Nonetheless, they have to give him. I think he has a six-year contract. Am I not mistaken? I think Dan yeah, yeah, Campbell. Yeah, 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 Dan Campbell. Okay, yeah. you're not getting, they're not getting rid of him. This, they're keeping him. Now, Colin Cowherd and those guys, they might make fun of him. Colin calls him a Fred Flintstone. Yeah. He might laugh at him for yeah, the first whatever. year, I mean, year and a half. A That's okay. That guy. It's okay. I like Colin. I like him, too. I, but I love his stuff. Sometimes, like, yeah, when he says that, stuff like that, it just but, makes you mad. But that's why you listen to him, and <laughs> yeah. that's why you watch him. And you him. stay down into it. You do listen to but him. Not, think, but uh, nonetheless, he's, they're going to make fun of him. Guy like uh, Pat McAfee. Is going to stay on his boat. I love Pat McAfee. Okay, love Pat McAfee. Th- now th- you're talking. This to guy me. ain't going anywhere. Look at the staff he's built. This he's going to have a coaching tree. Dan I'm, Campbell yeah. will have a coaching tree. All I, former players do. Yep. I, I love that staff. Deuce Staley, Aaron Glenn. If you're if you're Jeff Okuda, and we're going to get into some college Anthony Lynn. Uh, college coaches yeah. in, in in a little bit, Anthony Lynn. You know, you're talking about these guys. Who better to learn from if you're Jeff Okuda than Aaron freaking Glenn? Yeah. I, I mean, There's seriously. Always, yeah. I mean, Jeff Okuda probably doesn't even know how good Aaron Glenn was as a player. But my goodness, was that guy a great player in the NFL. I've always appreciated having former players as coaches. And it's from this standpoint. Because they know what you went through. They know what you've gone through. They know the position as it's played. Like, I had a couple wide receivers coaches that were never played the game. They were just coaches by night. And when they're, you know, giving you a, a play sheet and we're doing play calls and they're explaining the play and we're watching film, they only can see it from an X's and O's type stance. They're like, all right, you're supposed to break it off a of five yards. You, you come in. 
They don't know the inside the game. They don't know that when it's covered two, you can't run that route like that. I can't run that route like that line. So when you have players that passionate, they know the ins and outs of the game, and they can tell you the little nuances that the average guy can't. So I love the hiring of players. I always think that you should have some players or former players on your coaching staff. And it just converse, does wonders. Braylon, conversely, to pick up on your point there, I would have to imagine that former players are well more receptive of your input on how that play is going to work than some guy just drawing up X's and O's. Because the yeah. play, the former player knows. Uh, they, they've been in your spot. When you bring them a suggestion and say, Coach, this is not going to work, or Coach, I think this will work better, I think a former player is more receptive to your input as a player. Also, a lot of times, yeah, 100%, also a lot of times what happens, when you have defensive coordinators or offensive coordinators, uh, in the past, a lot of them hadn't played football at the highest level. A lot of them didn't even get past high school, but they just, you know, got under a certain tree. When you have a former player that can lobby for you, so, uh, you know, say you're my coach, and I tell you, hey, look, coach, it won't work this way because of this and the way we would do this. He's not going to take that input to the offensive coordinator mm-hmm. for me. I don't have to. So when we go in those meetings and the offensive coordinator sees something on film and he says, Braylon, why did you run the route like that? We're supposed to. And then on my behalf, my coach can step up and say, well, Chud, you know, the way that we had him do it and because of this and that. Now, Chud's like, oh, okay. But a lot of times if you just come to the coach, at, I mean a coordinator as a player, they brush you off. Doesn't matter that I'm third pick overall. Doesn't matter that I'm a pro bowler. It doesn't matter. Brush me off like I don't know the game. So a lot of times we have a coach that can advocate for you. Mm. It helps the relationship, man, and it, it, you'll see success. Yeah.